Okay, lesson 30, light spectra and excitation states. Okay, so first, first off, we're gonna do, well, some review, but it's review back from like way back in Science 9 when you guys had the space unit. Um, you guys talked about different types of, uh, of spectra, right? So and that was a long time ago, but we're gonna just briefly kind of go over like the different like, uh, types of spectra again. Um, there's three, there's going to be three main types here. So there's the first one is called a continuous spectrum. And the way this works is if you had some white light source, right? So a good example is the sun, right? Like the sun gives off pretty much all the colors in it. So white light, remember, contains all of the colors in that light. So if you shine that through, and then what this is, is just a slit to kind of get, you know, it, uh, like a beam of light type of a thing coming through this prism. Um, and then if you bend it, like we've talked about in the other units, then what would happen is you'd end up with this color spectrum on this side, right? You get, you get that type of a thing going on. Okay. Um, so that's called a continuous spectrum because the light is continuous, right? It's continuous from one side to the other. Now the next, the next one is called a emission or a bright line spectrum. Okay, so what's going on here? So instead of it being a white light source, so like just, just heating up something, right? Like this white light source would actually, this would always be the case if you just heated anything up really hot, right? So if I heated up a piece of metal extremely hot, it would, it, it would give me a continuous spectrum across there, right? Um, now what's happening is we're actually, we've got some gas, right? So, so just some heated or electrified gas. So maybe like neon or hydrogen or, you know, something like that, that's, that's in this container. And then we heat that up. Well, that actually looks different, right? So you do like it all, it's all the same. We, we send it through a slit there. We, we bend the light, but then on the other side of this, we don't get a continuous spectrum. We get these lines, these bright lines, right? This, this was a big mystery, right? At, at the time they were trying to, scientists were trying to figure out like, what's going on there? What, what does this have to do with anything? Why does this element right? Whatever's floating around in there, whatever gas is in there. What does that have to do with these individual energies, right? And they knew they were energies. They knew because they knew that red light there had a certain energy and green had a different energy. So this is a big piece of the puzzle. They're like, okay, something about the atomic structure of the gas in here is giving off these strips of light, right? So anyway, we're going to get into that, but, but for now that's, that's called emission because it's, it's, or bright line because it's giving like it's emitting or giving a bright line on the, on the uh, screen there. Okay. All right. So now what, a little bit, you know, going on here is they're talking a bit about astronomy and how this has been useful for astronomy. And this was your science nine, right? This is why I came up with space unit was because, um, you, what they were able to find actually was, was something like this, right? So if they looked closely at the sun, well, don't look at the sun, but like with the right instruments, um, they were able to see that there was actually these like missing spots. There was these missing things in the spectra, right? And, and what's actually happening there? So this would be like if looking at the sun, right? There'd be like these strips that are, that are blacked out from it. Well, what they found out is that these strips that are blacked out going across here when they were looking at it like in really f fine detail is that those like fingerprints you can almost think of them as um corresponded to the gas like to different types of known gases right they did this and they figured out like you know where these lines were and then they noticed that if they looked closely at these patterns happening on these strips they were actually the same kind of spacing between these, these, these lines as it would have been on the emission spectrum for let's say like helium or something or hydrogen or something. Right. So they're like, okay, well that, that's got something to do with like, you know, some kind of gas in there. And that's exactly what it was. So if the, the light from our sun, what's actually happening there is that the sun is very hot. If you didn't know, and it emits light. And then there's actually like an atmosphere on the sun where there's, there's a bit cooler gas on the outside of it. And the light has to shine through that gas on the, on the, the surface of the sun or 
you know, just, aw- just a bit away from the surface of the sun. Um, and what it does, well, and let's just even like look at this example in, in particular. So if you shine a bright white light into some cool gas or just cooler gas, right? Um, then what's going to happen is that the white light sh- comes in here with all of the different wavelengths, right? It's got all like trillions of different like wavelengths coming through there, right? But then this gas, the gas that's in here, it likes some of those wavelengths. Some of them, it's, it's perfect for it. So let's say there's w- some individual little molecule in there, right? In this gas, this wavelength comes in and it likes it. And what it happens is it like gobbles it up. It grabs it for a second. And then instead of shooting it back out the direction it was going, it'll shoot it out in some random direction, right? And what, what the result of that is, is that when you shine it through some kind, of, some kind of cool gas, most of the wavelengths make it through, but some didn't. And the ones that didn't are going to be our blacked out lines on, the, on, on this uh, uh, screen here. So this is called an absorption or a dark line spectrum, right? And, that, and that's happening because you're just like, it, this gas here is stealing some of, the, some of the wavelengths and then just shooting them out randomly in, in random places there. And the, the reason why this was so influential for astronomy was that they were able to actually see, looking out into the universe, that, hey, wait a minute, all those, because I, I can look at this and say, hey, that's, that's hydrogen, right? So we can look at stars on the other side, like, you know, like billions of light years away and see, hey, they have hydrogen in them, right? The other, the other well, and everything else we know, like there's no different, um, different elements. They're, they're like, it seems like everything in the universe is made of the same stuff that we have right here on Earth, right? Um, the other big part was, well, if you remember from physics 20 is the Doppler shift. So they noticed that all of these absorption lines, like let's say on, dif- on distant stars, they'd be like shifted over. So this line would be here and this line would be like there or something, right? Or even farther. And what that is, is that's called a red shift. And that means that those stars are actually moving away from us very fast. And using this idea, they were able to figure out that actually it seems like pretty much all the dist- distance galaxy, da- uh, distant galaxies are all moving away from us and the ones that are further away are moving away even faster. And this was really the basis for the beginning or for the theory of the Big Bang, right? That, that it seems like everything is expanding away from, from us, okay? Anyway, that's not really what this one's about, but that's why it was a, it was a big part of why it's so important, right? But anyway, let's get into the individual. Like, why are these lines where they are for this gas, right? Like, that's the big question that we're, we're, we're trying to answer here. Okay. So, oh, that's actually, sorry, that's a, pretty much everything I was just saying there. So, uh, oh, it, it, but this was, this was one of the big questions that they had was, okay, here is our absorption spectra, right? So these are our lines here. And you can see that these lines correspond to these lines pretty perfectly all the way down, right? So here's our absorption spectra. Here's our emission spectra. So that would, this would just be like heating up a gas of some kind, right? And they line up perfectly, but what is this? Like what, those ones aren't there. Like why do we have more lines on the emission spectrum than we do on the absorption spectrum? So, and this is for sodium vapor. So this was a big question, right? So we're gonna try to answer that here in a little bit. Okay, so another experiment that you guys have to figure out um, how, how it works. So this is called the Frank Hertz experiment made by two Scientist, Frank, and Hertz. Um, and here's what they did. So they filled up a chamber with mercury vapor, right? So there's, just imagine that there's like little mercury vapor all the way through this chamber there, okay? Then what they did is they, they sent a voltage, right? So there's, they, they applied, there's a screen here. So they, this would be like one end, you know? So this would be like your you know, positive end, and this would be like your negative end. And it shot electrons like we do so often, or they did so often. They shot electrons this way, right? They applied a voltage across here. 
and then the electrons would jump from one end to the other. You don't have to get too bogged down into like, you know, built-in resistor and variable resistor and all that kind of stuff, right? The main idea is you've got this chamber and you've got electrons that, um, that we're going to be shooting from this side to this side, okay? Now, the more electrons they get through, well, lots and lots of electrons, that just means lots and lots of current. And we should be able to read that using our and meter, right? That's what a, or a micro and meter for very small currents. Um, so we should, they should be able to measure how much current or how many electrons are actually making it through, right? So what the idea here is that he's, um, he's thinking that some of these electrons are going to bump into the mercury that's in the chamber, right? Because this thing's full of these little mercury molecules. So he's just testing, okay, what's going to happen? Are they going to bump into each other a lot? Are they going to bump into each other like a little bit? You know, so, so that's the, the basis of the idea here, okay? And here's what they got. Here, here's what they ended up with. Oh, my God. Oh, no, good. Phew. You guys are still there, right? <laughs> it, it looked funny on my screen. The little icon looked like it went away. I thought that was talking to myself. Okay, <laughs> anyway. Okay, so... Uh, the experiment, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's what here's what they had. So as he would or they would turn the voltage up, right? So they'd apply a bigger and bigger voltage across the cathode and the anode. Okay, so that goes up and up and up, and that's what our x-axis is here, right? Turning that voltage up. Then on our y-axis, we've got our current. So the current is really measuring how many of these electrons are actually making it to the other side, right? That's what we're measuring with the ammeter. All right, so this is the weird thing that happened, is you would expect that the higher and higher I turn the voltage up, well, what that would do, right? The more, the more and more I turn the voltage up, the more and more electrons you're gonna free from this cathode. So the, the more and more I turn the voltage up, the more current I should, I should register, right? And that is what happened, right? So it starts going up and up and up like you would expect. But then this, right? This is the, the weird thing that happened. So it goes up and up and up like you'd expect. But then right at these dips, what's going on there, right? So he would turn it up and up and up until he got to 4.89 volts. And then it, it, it dropped. So you get like a big drop like that. Then... Um, it would start to go back to kind of normal. As you turn it up, it would go up and up and up and up and up. And then at uh, 6.67 and 8.84, so like right here and right here, we get these little dips. And then you get a really big dip again at 9.8, okay? So here's what, what the, the, uh, they theorized, is they said that, um, there was no interaction, so no electrons. None of these electrons here were hitting any mercury before this many volts, before 4.89 volts, right? And then as soon as you get to that 4.89 volts, it seems like a ton of them are hitting these mercury, right? Like pretty much all of them. The current almost dropped down to nothing there, right? So almost all of these electrons are like hitting all of these mercury vapors, and almost none of them are getting through. Okay, um, so what he was saying is that actually it seems like if you shoot an electron into a mercury atom, so there's a mercury atom and there is an electron, if I shoot this one into this, like let's say with four electron volts, then it actually would never, like the mercury atom would never absorb any of that energy. It never hits, okay? And it would just leave with four. But if we end up giving an electron exactly 4.9 electron volts, then it would absorb it, it gobbles it up perfectly. It loves that energy. That's like the energy that mercury likes. So it takes that energy and then the electron carries on with no more energy. It would actually, it took all of the electrons energy away from it, okay? And then energy is greater than 4.9. So let's say if this thing came in with six electron volts, then it would hit, the mercury atom would gobble up 4.9 electron volts, and then the, um, the electron would leave with whatever it had left, so 1.1 in that case. Okay, so 
And then at energies of 6.7 and 8.8, .8, it likes those energies, but it doesn't like it as much as 4.9. 4.9 is like what it prefers. It really likes that amount of energy. Okay. And then similar, once we once he had 9.8 electron volts, so that corresponds to this dip right here, then what they figure is happening is that you've got a collision with some mercury atom losing 4.9 electron volts. But then you can imagine once it hit that, right? If it had 9.8, once it, it lost 4.9, then you'd have another free electron roaming around with 4.9. And it's going to get gobbled up by another mercury atom really quickly because mercury loves 4.9 electron volts. Okay. And every atom would have a different one, but mercury likes, really likes that one. Right? So that's the idea. So, that's why 9.8 is, is uh, so big too, is because it's just double of 4.9. Okay, so other ways to think about this. So you guys are going to see pictures like this a lot in this unit from now on. So these are our energy level diagrams. Okay, so here's the idea, is that different atoms have different excitation states. And maybe I'll jump to the gist, or to the ch chase here, because a bunch of you guys have taken chemistry, and I find it like a, a helpful mental picture. What these excitation states are, what, the, what they're gonna relate to, when we get into it, it's gonna be the Bohr model. So let's say if we had something like hydrogen, just simple hydrogen, right? Where you had a proton, and you guys have probably seen these pictures before where you've got a proton, and then you've got these different, these different orbits that the electron could be in. Those orbits are our excitation states. So this would be like the amount of energy to like, bump it up to, well, let's say this was our first excitation state. So this would be like our ground state right here. Like this is, that's where, that's where the electron likes to hang out. And then this would be our, our uh, first energy level would be like up here, right? So that's kind of where we're going here. Like that's the, this is the picture that we're gonna end up with. I find it helpful to, to think about um, at this point too, so. Um, okay, so here's the idea though, is we get, an electron bumps into this thing. Actually, I guess I have a good picture below. But anyway, if you end up giving this thing enough energy, right, at this like 10.4, well, that's actually called the ionization level. And ionization means the amount of energy required to strip the, uh, the electron from it, okay? Okay, so let's, oh, and the other kind of amazing part of this is, so, okay, so he's shooting, so that's, that's a tube. He's shooting these electrons into the, these mercury um, molecules, right? And what he noticed that like these dips, whenever he was like losing like current, like it wasn't making it through to the other side. Well, this would actually give off light, right? This, this tube would start to like actually give off light. And the light wave that it gave off, if we use Einstein's equation there, right? Energy is equal to Planck's constant times C over wave like that we've been using the amount of energy that it gave off was exactly the amount uh, or was exactly at the, at the energy drop off at that point, which is amazing, right? Like that, that's, it, it's, and it's all of it, right? So that, like that we were getting at these points here, the amount of current that was missing um, or the amount of energy that was missing from the other side that like the amount of energy that wasn't making it to the plate over here was actually perfectly accounted for in the wave that carried the energy away. And that was using theory that had been thought up like just before this, right? So that, like, this is the way science works. The, they came up with this new tool, this new picture to, exp to explain things. And then they were able to use this to, to, to actually come up with a new model, right? So yeah, let's move on. Okay, so in summary though, here's what we just kind of talked about. Here was our, our model here. So if we have collisions with high energy electrons, can you guys circle that if you have yours too, like electrons? Cause we're gonna do photons in a minute. So that's gonna be the difference. So with high energy electrons, then this is the case, right? If you had something with like six electron volts um, coming in, then if it didn't have that excitation level, um, oh, sorry, it, it does have that excitation level. So it's a six is above 4.89. So it's going to hit the molecule and, um, or the atom, 
and it's going to hit the atom and it's going to leave with what, with the energy that it has left. Right. So it's going to, um, excite this mercury atom. So this mercury atom jumps up to the first energy level, right? So it's excited. It's sitting there at, at 4.89. Okay. Now, if we have a incoming photon, right? So light. So instead of electron, then it's actually, it behaves differently. Um, light has to be an exact match. So in this case, this six electron volt or electron that came in, right? It would bounce into the part, into the molecule or the, into the, the atom and bounce off with the energy that it has left. Now, a photon doesn't work that way. If you had a wave that came in with, let's say, you know, five electron volts, so a wave that came in with five electron volts, then it just passes right through. It doesn't, it doesn't leave the atom with 4.89 electron volts and then pass through with the rest like, like an electron would. A photon just passes right through. So the only, the only waves that this thing will gobble up will be waves that match this energy, this energy, this energy, and this energy exactly. Okay. So, so, so that's the idea. Oh, and that's what, that's what this is saying too. Like if you had six electron volts, it would just pass right through, right? If you had seven, it would pass right through. Like it wasn't, it wasn't even there. Okay. So make sure you get the difference between these two things down, right? So electrons bump into them and then give off the rest of the energy or, and then carry away with the rest of the energy. Photons have to be an exact match. Okay, so now, release of energy. So what? So once these things get excited, once they they get bounced up to a certain energy level, then then what happens, right? And we've talked actually a little bit about this in the light unit already. Um, what happens? So if you've got, oh, I don't want you. Um. So let's say we get something that bounces up to 8.84 electron volts. Then here, let's draw our atom again because I find this helpful. Okay, so that's like our first energy level. Let's say this is our second energy level here. Let's call that like 4.89 electron volts. So it's like right there. So what happens? So if, if the electron is normally sitting here and then you give it the perfect amount of energy to like bounce it up to here, right? So now the electron is sitting up on this first energy level. It's, it's unstable is what it's called. So it's sitting up there, but it's like it's perched on like a, a ledge where it's just about to fall off, right? It, 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 it's going to fall down eventually. So the electron jumps up for a second and then randomly, just like at any given time, it will jump back down again. And it's the jumping back down again that actually sends an electromagnetic wave off the, in this direction. And doesn't that make sense? We did that in, in the other unit, right? Where if you have an accelerating electric charge, then you start that process of an electromagnetic wave, right? That electromagnetic or magnetic electric, magnetic electric, right? So this is the thing that gets it all going. It's, it's the electron jumping back down. That's what light is. That's what most light is. It's all just electrons jumping back down in their, in their orbit. Okay, so, so that's the idea. Now, these things can jump down in any given sequence though. So the idea here is that they could, you know, start here and then jump down to the bottom or, you know, or from here down to the bottom or here down to the bottom, but they can also jump from, let's say 8.84 down to 6.67, hang out there for a little bit. And then from there, jump down one more or down straight down to the bottom. It, it could do any kind of path in between. I always kind of think about this. I don't know if you guys have seen the prices, right? I think about it like Plinko. So it starts up at the top and it might go like, you know, pretty fast down to the bottom or it might, you know, hit this one and then go from there down to this one and there and then there down to that one, right? Like it's kind of random whatever one it goes down to. But those are all the different kinds of waves we could have there. Okay. Now, just to kind of bring it back to the beginning there. Um, this theory or this, this idea of what's happening here, this explains now, we go all the way back up here, what was happening with our emission spectrum, right? Because the, the question was, why do we have these extra lines, right? When we have like an emission spectrum as opposed to an absorption, 
Well, it's because absorption spectrums, right? They only, the absorption spectrum will only ever take light from like zero to like that one or zero. So it'll be like at 4.89, 6.67, 8.84, yada, yada, right? Those exact numbers is what it'll gobble up. But when it spits the light back out, it can do that Plinko thing and it can give all these different intermediate um, light in between. Right. So that's where the emission spectrum comes from. There's actually, there's always going to be more emission spectrum than there will be absorption. Okay. So let's do our uh, practice problems. Okay. So a Frank Hertz experiment was carried out on a lictium vapor in the chamber. The energies of the electrons uh, sent into the chamber E, so the input, and those coming out of the chamber E output were measured and the data was given below. What can be inferred about the possible energies, uh, energy levels within this fictitious atom? Assume that the ground state energy is zero. All right, so what's going on here? So input, this, is me, this means like this amount of energy I'm putting into it. To like th that, this is the amount of energy that the electron in our mercury vapor tube, right? That's the amount of energy that this thing had to begin with. Right? How much energy do they have? Like how much speed do they have coming out of this, uh, out of the gates? And then the output is like how much is actually being registered on the other side. Okay, so if it initially had four electron volts, then the output was four coming out. Okay, if I had five electron volts, then I had zero coming out. So what does that mean? So essentially what that means is that none of it gets through, right? All of these electrons are getting, are interacting with all of this lectium vapor, right? None of it is getting to the other side of our, um, of the cathode there. Um, okay. So number one says draw an energy level diagram for lectium. So I'm going to draw that here. Okay. So if our ground state, we're going to call, zero electron volts and i'll just be right at the bottom there and then here i'm gonna make some lines our first energy level well that's going to be right where it gobbled up all of the all of our energy right so that's going to be at five right that's our first one so five electron volts all right so where's the next one it's the next one it keeps going up and up and up and then we get to seven right and then again at seven at least so none of it gets through or two of them get through. Okay. So what does that mean? So none of them gets through. Well, that means that at seven, right? So it like all of the electrons are getting gobbled up by our seven energy level. And then the two comes in because maybe, maybe some of these electrons just interacted with the five, right? With five electrons and then left two right so two more electron volts were like left and given to it okay so either way though it's going to be our seven electron volts is going to be our next one and then the next one going down we've got well again i'm looking for those zeros right because that's where it's going to eat up all of my energy right so it really likes eight as well right it ate all of my eight electron volts so it's also going to be eight electron volts all right so that, there there's my energy level diagram Okay, number two, what wavelengths of light would you expect lectium to absorb? All right, so that's the light coming in. So remember the light coming in has to be an exact match, right? If we're talking about photons, it's not like it has to be a certain energy to absorb it, okay? So we have an equation for this. Well, these are all in energies, right? And I wanna talk in wavelengths. Okay, so we need the equation that relates those two. So we, we have one now. Energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. All right, I'm gonna rearrange this for wavelength. So we've got wavelength is equal to um, HC over E. Now, we're gonna do this equation just over and over again pretty much for all of these questions. So. Let's, let's do one and then we'll do it the exact same thing a bunch of times. So let's figure out the wave that corresponds to the five electron volt energy. So I'll call that the wavelength at five. So subscript five. 
So that's going to be equal to, so Planck's constant. Now, which Planck's constant do we use? Well, we were using energies of electron volts. So I'm going to use the one on my formula sheet that has electron volts. So that's that 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volts times seconds. And then that times the speed of light. So three times 10 to the eight meters per second and then over five electron volts and you know what I'm going to do too just because what we're going to do here this the wavelength the only thing that's going to change for each of them is we're just going to throw in a different energy for each of them so I'm actually going to put in my calculator this is what I would do I put this top part into your calculator right and you'd end up getting one point two four two times 10 to the negative six right i put that in my calculator and then as i find all the rest of these these wavelengths i would just keep on going back up in my calculator push the up button until you get to this number again and then push enter to bring it back down and then we can just divide by the the new energy right but anyway that, that's what i would do just to save time there but okay so then the wavelength for five if you just put that all in, it's gonna end up being, we get 2.48 times 10 to the negative seven meters. Okay, so that probably relates to this one, right? But they've got it written in nanometers. Well, so a nanometer, again, on your formula sheet there, is times 10 to the negative nine. So if I move this decimal one, two times to the right, well, that would be the same thing as two point, or no, 248 and then times 10 to the negative nine meters. Okay, well then I can just rewrite that as 248 nanometers, right? Nano is times 10 to the negative nine. Okay, so there's our first one. Okay, so we'll go a bit quicker now. We'll be all right moving on here, I think. So let's say, okay, what's the wavelength for the energy at seven, right? What's the wave that corresponds to that one? Okay, well, I'm just gonna write this number again. So that's gonna be our 1.242 times 10 to the negative six divided by, and now it's seven electron volts. Okay, and that one will end up being 177 nanometers. And then just the same thing for the last one. So we'll say, okay, what's the wavelength? at eight. So that'd be that 1.242 times 10 to the negative six, and then divided by eight electron volts. So that one would be 155 nanometers. Okay, so th there's our three, right? That we're expecting it would absorb. Okay, now it says, what wavelengths of light would you expect light, uh, lightium to emit? It says there's a total of six wavelengths. So what does that mean? So let's, let's try our picture again here. Oop. Yeah, okay. So if we had zero electron volts and then we had five electron volts and then seven, these don't have to be the scale by the way, eight, Electron volts. There, I should draw those as lines. All right, now. Okay, so emitting. So again, remember how they emit? Where you could have all of these ones, right? Where it goes from eight, you know, down to zero. Or it could be from seven down to zero. Or it could be from five down to zero. And those wavelengths, right? We already did that. We already figured out what the wavelengths were for those because those are like the exact same as the absorption waves, right? So we've already figured out three of them. But now what else do we have? Well, we actually still have eight down to seven, right? Because that could be one. It could it plays Planck on the way down, right? It could just drop down to seven. It could drop down to five. Okay, so those could happen. And then it could also go from seven down to five. And then that's it. We've accounted for all of them. So there's our six energy, like electron jumps, right? Where they jump back down. 
Okay, so we got to find all six of those. So we found three of them. So here, I'm going to call it wavelength one, the other, the other. So, okay, so we'll say wavelength one was, here, I'll call this, that's one, two, three, that'll be four, five, and six. So wavelength one was our one down from eight, right? We already did that one. So that's going to be 155 nanometers, right? For that one, this is the same thing. Wavelength two was the energy for seven, right? Nope. So that was 177 nanometers. And then wavelength three would have been 248 nanometers. All right, and then we gotta find the other ones now. So wavelength four, wavelength four, well, if you think about what's happening here, it goes from eight to seven, so that has a difference of one. Okay, so wavelength four would be, I'm gonna use that same number I used up here, right? That is that, you know, um, Planck's constant times speed of light. So we'll say that's 1.242 times 10 to the negative six divided by one electron volt. Okay, so wavelength at four would be 1,242 nanometers, right? And that's just, if you move the decimal three times to the right, that would turn that to times 10 to the negative nine, right? So, okay, so there's that one. And I'll put boxes around the, oh, shoot. Put boxes around these. We're getting there. Wavelength five would be, okay, so five goes from eight down to five. So that's, that's over three. So it'll be the same thing. So it's going to be 1.242 um, times times 10 to the negative six divided by three electron volts. So wavelength five will be 414 nanometers and then wavelength six so wavelength six went from seven to five so that's a difference of two so it'll be 1.242 times 10 to the negative six divided by two electron volts so that one will be 621 nanometers all right, phew. Okay, last one. If an atom was excited to the fourth excitation state, how many possible wavelengths of light would be emitted when the atom fell to its ground state? All right, so, let me write it over here. Let's sketch this out. Okay, so we'll say one, two, three, I'll call four at the top. All right, so one, two, three, four for my excitation states, right? So it said how many possible could be emitted, right? So emitted means that it could, it's that Plinko thing, right? It could, it could land on any one of them in between. So we got to try to figure out all of them. So try to find the best kind of pattern you can to get them all. This is what I would do is I would start maybe at the top and say, okay, what could this do? Well, it could go all the way down. It could go down to number one. It could go down to number two. And it could go down to number three. Okay, so I got four account for, right? So those would be all the, all the ways that if it was sitting up on the fourth excitation level, all the ways that it could drop down, okay? And then I'd move on to three. I'd say, okay, well, if it was sitting at three, what could it do? Well, it could drop all the way down. It could drop down to one. It could drop down to two. All right, so there's all the ways it could drop down from the third excitation level. Okay, and then for two, it could drop down to one. Or sorry, it could drop all the way down to the bottom. It could drop down to one. And that's it, right? And then lastly, you could just say, okay, well, right here, it could be on one and then just drop down to the bottom, and that's it. So if you count those up, we've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So there you go.
there's all the different ways it could emit. And we don't have to figure out what they are. They just said, you know, how many would there be? Okay, so that's it. Um, hopefully you guys are okay with that.